Welcome to the first Public Information Center, or PIC, for the Dixie Dundas Flood Mitigation Project. This project being completed by the City of Mississauga for the Little Etobicoke Creek is the Schedule C Municipal Class Environmental Assessment. All of the slides you'll see on this uh, presentation are available at the City's website, which is mississauga.ca slash flooding. Of course, we would have much rather met people in person, but we've had to adapt our presentation and this public information center to be online because of COVID-19 reasons. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Steve Braun. I'll be providing some overview to each of the slides, sometimes reading them, sometimes going into a little more detail. I just wanted to also introduce some of the other consultants who we've been working with. Prime Strategy and Planning has been uh, relied upon for uh, public interaction and uh, planning services, EA uh, expertise. Cambium Indigenous Professional Services has been our link to First Nations who are certainly will, are interested in this project. RV Anderson is uh, our consultant and the main expertise uh, behind uh, bridge crossings, transportation, and uh, other linear infrastructure in the area. And Matrix Solutions has really been involved mostly with the hydraulics, the geomorphology of the creek, and the environmental uh, or e ecological background. Our contact information for the project is, uh, there are two project managers, one for the city, Anthony DiGian Domenico, and Andrew Doherty, who's with Matrix. If you would like to be included on the project mailing list and to provide your input, please download and complete a project comment form, which is available on the city's website, mississauga.ca slash flooding, and submit that completed form by email to either Anthony or Andrew, per their email uh, addresses on this form. We're going to be accepting input and public, uh, public comment until September 4th of 2020. And thanks very much for considering participating in this. As an overview to the Public Information Center, or PIC, we're going to be talking about existing conditions, problem and opportunities at the site, hydraulic screening that's been done to date, conceptual alternative solutions, preliminary impact assessment, and next steps. It's really worth emphasizing that the purpose of this PIC is to introduce the public to the project. This is the first uh, chance for the public and, and others to have input uh, towards the project and learn about what's going on at the site. We wanna emphasize it's, it's an introduction and there will be another PIC uh, once preliminary the designs have been thought through a little bit. Consultation is an essential part of the municipal Class EA process. We want to ensure that anyone with an interest in the study has the opportunity to provide input as the study proceeds. We're engaging the following stakeholders to provide the opportunity to express concerns and pre preferences. These include local residents and businesses, regulators, and of course the Indigenous communities. Engagement will provide an opportunity to collaborate on the project and identify concerns or additional studies that may be required. Cambium Indigenous Professional Services will facilitate discussions with the Indigenous community regarding traditional lands and knowledge. Let's start with a project overview. In terms of project overview, the Dixie Dundas Flood Mitigation Feasibility Study Municipal Class EA process seeks solutions to address flooding from Little Etobicoke Creek to protect the existing residences and businesses, as well as to enable future growth. There are approximately a thousand residential, commercial, and industrial properties between the Little Etobicoke Creek study area and the Queen Elizabeth Way that are at risk of flooding. The city of Mississauga has an interest to intensify the Dixie Dundas corridor to fulfill the vision of growth expressed in the Dundas Connects master plan. You can see the study area in terms of uh, detailed hydraulics and, and other planning efforts uh, outlined in red to the right. 
The extent of flooding associated with the spill out of Little Etobicoke Creek up around the Queen Frederica area, this is right at the top of the map located to the right, labeled spill location. We're going to see a very interesting video of that in, in, in a few slides. But as part of the phase one of a different study uh, with the Little Etobicoke Creek flood evaluation study, the following extent of flooding was determined and detailed through some very, very detailed regional flood map. This indicated about a thousand residential, commercial and industrial properties to be at significant flood risk. As well, this flood risk was only mapped as far as the QEW. Flooding is anticipated to continue beyond the QEW to make its way out to Lake Ontario. The City of Mississauga's Dundas Connects Master Plan is a separate project from the Class EA, but a related project which expresses a vision of growth centered around the Dixie GO station and proposed higher order transit along Dundas Street. This vision of growth cannot be fully implemented without first addressing the flooding in the study area. For more information on the Dundas Connects Master Plan, visit their website, which is at Dundas Connects all one word, dot ca. Outlining a project timeline, we can be, begin with background. As early as 2012, there was some initial 2D modeling done to define the very complex flooding that occurs at Dixie Dundas. That significant flooding event that occurred July 8, 2013, ensured that uh, the 2D modeling would be finalized and this was done so right down to the CNR underpass, that being completed around 2015. An expansion of the 2D modeling to define flooding right down to the QEW was completed as part of the Little Etobicoke Creek Flood Evaluation Study and Master Plan. And for more information on that concurrent study, please visit the city's website at mississauga.ca slash flooding. This led to the current project which is the Class CA and this PIC. Stage one of that project be began in April 2019, just to outline what is happening here in terms of existing conditions. And uh, we'll present some more in this PIC about that. Last month, it was wrapped up, uh, allowing the Schedule C Class EA to begin, which uh, is anticipated to, to last until the end of the year. Following that, any detailed design that comes out of the Class EA would be anticipated to be completed in 2021. Any required land acquisition anticipated to be um, completed or, or begun at least in 2022 with construction anticipated 2025 through 2027. Just rounding out a discussion of the feasibility study, which has been completed over the past year, just completed in July. It was a very challenging project from a technical perspective, both hydraulically and otherwise. And the team really had to take their time to tackle the technical components before being able to demonstrate feasibility and really present anything to the public as part of the EA. A very thorough background review was done four new technical studies were completed. Concurrent with the technical studies that were completed uh, was a hydraulic screening exercise. And, and these outlined very uh, high level solutions to see what was actually possible at this site. This resulted in conceptual alternative solutions as outlined, uh, which is a great starting place for the current EA. The following slide outlines the municipal class EA process and specifically the five phases that are typically associated. Currently we're in phase two, which is alternative solutions. We've completed some of the, some of the background inventory material through the feasibility study. Some of the alternative solutions are, have been worked on and, and we, we are identifying ways of, of determining what might be the preferred solution. But prior to that, we're certainly through this PIC consulting with the public and we would value, very much value your input, uh, consulting review agencies as well. 
Once we're finished with phase two, we will come up with a preferred solution. That will be the end of phase two. At that point, we'll be able to start developing alternative design concepts for the preferred solution. This is when we'll come back to you, the public, during PIC number two, and we'll start evaluating those alternative designs and we'll start to prepare preliminary designs. Following that, we'll complete an environmental study report, which will summarize the, the entire process and, and thoughts that have gone into it. This is followed by construction or implementation, which as outlined earlier, is anticipated to occur around 2025. Moving on to existing conditions. It's not often flood modelers get the advantage of seeing a real world event that somewhat confirms or maybe not calibrates, but certainly validates their models. What is uh, being shown in the video here is a storm that everyone in Mississauga will remember, the July 8th, 2013 storm. We can see cars trying to cross. This is Dundas Street looking east, trying to cross through the Queen Frederica uh, roadway. They are, uh, they shouldn't be doing this, of course. And later in the video, you'll, you'll actually see people trying to get across too. This is exactly uh, illustrates well what the city is trying to accomplish through this project, which is elimination of this flood. It should also be pointed out that this flood is probably only about half of the water that would be occurring under a regulatory event or a Hurricane Hazel event. I'll just let the video go here and I just wanted to uh, outline that you can see on the right of the slide where exactly that video is being taken and some of the depths that were per, per, uh, some of the depths that were uh, predicted through modeling again through this intersection very dangerous conditions here's another video of the july 8th 2013 flooding event taken at the cnr underpass on dixie road just a little bit south of dundas you can see this is where some of the water from the previous video ends up. Certainly not, not all of it by any means. Again, a very good example. Uh, while it allowed the model to match up to real world conditions using the modeled rainfall uh, that occurred on that day. You can see the risk of flooding in this area is expected to be reduced or eliminated uh, by implementing flood mitigation solutions thus opening up opening up the Dixie uh, roadway during flooding events. The following slide outlines an excerpt of floodplain mapping representing existing conditions at the study area. The regional vent, which is in, in this case Hurricane Hazel, a historical storm from 1954, if that were to occur again over the watershed of the Little Etobicoke Creek, we would predict a flow of approximately 200 cubic meters per second at the area of spill on Queen Frederica Drive. At that point, over 130 of that 200 jumps the bank of the creek and starts heading down the street of Queen Frederica Drive, which of course is a, is a big problem and the reason why we're doing this study. The area that floods below is very extensive, expands over a very wide urbanized area. And we certainly saw the effect uh, through those previous, previous videos. And again, that July 8th, 2013 event was probably in the range of about half or a little bit more than half of that regulatory event. Here are a couple of photos of Little Etobicoke Creek as it exists today, upstream and downstream of Dixie Road. You can see the creek has been channelized with armoring, creating a narrow and quite a deep channel. The armor stone downstream has fallen out of place in some areas. The kind of flows that go through the creek here are very flashy. Velocities are very high because it's so confined. 
There are different types of flooding, and flooding can be quite intricate, complicated, and involve multiple aspects. It can include riverine flooding or urban flooding. And by urban flooding, I'm, I'm talking more about storm sewers that might be exceeded, catch basins that are overflowed, or grading on your, on your, on your lot that is not uh, quite right. Where the unwanted water and flooding comes from is important to recognize. In the case of Little Etobicoke Creek, we're talking mainly about riverine flooding. And the focus of the Dixie Dundas flood mitigation is to solve that major system of riverine flooding. And we're gonna do that by keeping flows within the Little Etobicoke Creek Valley Corridor. It's certainly true that urban flooding can also occur independently and perhaps quite close by to this riverine flooding on private property. And that could be due to poor lot grading or blockages in private ditches or catch basin. Minor system and urban flooding are being assessed within the concurrent Little Etobicoke Creek flood evaluation study and master plan. And more information will be available about that urban flooding if you look on the city's website at mississauga.ca slash flooding. Agency roles and responsibilities are outlined here, and you can see below the three main agencies involved, all together working in a very integrated fashion to solve floodplain problems at the site. Really interesting here, a unique situation where although the Little Etobicoke Creek is really the jurisdiction of the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, where it spills, that spill water or a lot of it goes into the Credit Valley Conservation jurisdiction. And for that reason, CVC has been involved. The problem and opportunity statements are an important first phase of the EAA process. And it's really essential to clearly define those problems and opportunity statements. I'm not going to read them here, but it's worth pointing out that this is the problem and opportunity as seen so far with public input and input from other agencies and First Nations and others, we may find adjustments of these statements. But the statement so far that's been identified, and maybe I'll just read the summary statement, residences and businesses near the major transit station area at Dixie Dundas are currently highly vulnerable to flooding from Little Etobicoke Creek. The Dixie Dundas Flood Mitigation Feasibility Study and Class EA will assess solutions to provide flood protection to residences and businesses, as well as to enable future growth. From here, we'll move on to screening of potential mitigation options. This slide in the next few outlines screening of potential mitigation options. And what we're doing here is looking at an overall strategy, looking how it would perform and uh, determining whether it would be a feasible outcome to pursue further or not. Our screening scenarios uh, include, always would include a conveyance improvement, which is the first one up here. The screening scenario is either increase the channel conveyance by widening the creek, or perhaps lowering it and deepening the creek. Uh, a bridge replacement, replace the Dixie Road Bridge with a larger structure that would allow more flow through it. In looking at those screening outcomes, it seems that combining channel conveyance improvements with replacement of the Dixie Road Bridge is quite quite feasible. The next screening, screening option we looked at was flood containment, which is quite different than improving the downstream conveyance. Under these uh, scenarios, we looked at berms and dikes. And this, this would be a raised bank or long wall, a flood protection landform known as an FPL. This is a wide berm-like structure on, the, on this case would be on the south side of Little Etobicoke Creek or a flood wall. This would be a high wall designed to contain flooding. The screening outcome right away uh, led us to, well it showed through provincial policy that both flood walls and berms dikes are not considered permanent solutions under current provincial policy and therefore would not meet the project objectives of enabling growth at Dixie Dundas. An FPL or floodplain landform is technically feasible 
And the use of an FBL has been accepted as a permanent solution in the past at the Don River site in uh, the city of Toronto. Next up on our screening of potential mitigation options are flow diversions. Uh, firstly, a, an upstream flow diversion where buried pipes um, would be placed upstream of the study area to divert flows from Little Etobicoke Creek watershed over to its ultimate outlet, the Etobicoke Creek proper. Um, we also looked at local flow diversion. This would be flow diversion conduits along where that spill occurs now on Queen Frederica Drive. And that would also go out, out Dundas Street East, out towards uh, the Etobicoke Creek proper. The screening outcome here was upstream fl flow diversion is anticipated to be very impractical due to cost, a multitude of utility conflicts and a lot of ecological considerations as well. Local flow diversion is is also not considered feasible due to significant land and, and pipe cost requirements. Next up in our screening was flow storage. And here, could we put in enough storage somewhere to reduce the flows uh, through attenuation? And this is the so-called regional flood control. And this is installing large storage facilities upstream to contain the flood. There's also online storage to reduce the capacity of upstream bridges to, uh, to reduce flows at Dixie Dundas. And the screening outcome, again, was, was quite clear. Regional flood control is not considered feasible on its own due to significant storage volume requirements in the millions of cubic meters would be required. Online storage would not be acceptable in Ontario under current policy either, under most situations. The final potential mitigation options we looked at through our screening process in, included policy measures. Here we looked at flood proofing, and these would be structural alterations to buildings to reduce flood damages, and also land acquisition, which would reduce flood risks through mainly through property purchases. The outcome of screening showed here that these policy measures are not considered practical on their own as over a thousand residential, commercial, and industrial properties are involved. These just below the spill location, never mind those that uh, were not accounted for south of the QEW. Policy measures would not meet project objectives of enabling growth at Dixie Dundas. The screening out of some potential mitigation options allowed us to drill down to what would be more conceptual alternative solutions. And we will get into those here. Conceptual alternative solutions, in addition to considering the various hydraulic mitigation options and policy mitigation options that were screened as previously discussed, also considered technical studies that were done concurrently last year with the hydraulic studies. These studies are outlined below include a geotechnical study by Thurber, a stage one archeology span assessment by ASI, as well as a fluvial geomorphology study done by Matrix and, and a natural heritage study done by Matrix. These technical studies were also used to help guide the conceptual alternative solutions. The initial hydraulic and policy screening of mitigation options concluded that keeping flow within the Little Etobicoke Creek Valley Corridor is hydraulically feasible and determined the best approaches to fit the land constraints imposed by the highly urbanized watershed. Based on this conclusion, three alternative solutions were developed to conceptual design. These concepts will be evaluated against a do nothing option. The options are as follows. Option one, improved conveyance with minimized footprint. Option two, improved conveyance by making room for the creek. Option three, flood containment with mitigation for upstream impacts. And option four, do nothing. Each alternative represents a very different approach to keeping flow within the Little Etobicoke Creek Valley Corridor, but each is combined with a Dixie Road Bridge replacement. 
And now we'll give a little more detail to each of the options. Option one, the improved conveyance with minimized footprint, includes a concept that creates a narrow and deep channel from about 500 meters upstream of Dixie to 700 meters downstream. The channel top width would be increased from the existing 10 to 20 meters up to 17 to 30 meters, so not a huge increase. The upstream 600 meters of channel though would be lowered by one meter on average. The preliminary cost estimate to do this is in around $23 million. And you can see conceptual, conceptually how this looks. Our next conceptual alternative is option two, improved conveyance by making room for the creek. This alternative is modeled on natural channel design concepts with a widened channel and a lowered adjacent ground to create a much wider floodplain and better connected floodplain. This from about 500 meters upstream of Dixie Road to 700 meters downstream. The channel top width increased from the existing 10 to 20 meters to 17 to 21 meters. The channel depth though is reduced from the existing 1.6 to 3.5 meters to 1.6 to 2 meters. And this is done by lowering adjacent ground to create a better floodplain. Upstream, the upstream 600, millime, 600 meters of channel is lowered by one meter on average. And the preliminary cost estimate for this option is $22 million, which includes a bridge replacement. Our next conceptual alternative is option three, which is floodplain containment with mitigation for upstream impacts. The concept of this alternative is to contain the regional event within the valley corridor using a flood protection landform known as an FPL. The FPL would extend from approximately 500 meters upstream of Dixie Road to 700 meters downstream of Dixie Road. This option requires quite a wide footprint area due to the shallow slope on the dry side of the FPL. Minor widening for the upstream 600 meters of channel would, would counter backwater impacts of the FPL. The preliminary cost estimate for this option is in the range of $146 million due to the bridge replacement, but mostly to significant property impacts. Replacement of the Dixie Road Bridge is an important aspect of the project. Currently over half of the regional event spills from the creek upstream of Dixie Road, with this spill partially caused by backwater created from the bridge. The existing Dixie Road Bridge is not able to convey flow from the regional event, and especially not able to if all flow were to remain in the Creek Valley Corridor as part of a flood mitigation solution. Solving the spill by keeping flow within the valley corridor requires the bridge to be replaced. With the Dixie Road bridge replacement being such an important aspect to each of the conceptual alternative solutions, RV Anderson completed some detailed calculations on span and road construction of, of Dixie Road uh, related to the span for each of the options. For option one, a span of 26 meters was required. Option two, a span of 45 meters is anticipated. Option three included a span of a, a little lower again at 28 meters. What's being balanced here is when the span is longer, the requirement to raise Dixie Road is less. So a longer span results in a less road construction. And this balance has been, um, is being, uh, will be considered more. And certainly we will be returning to this in phase three of the EA process. As well for each, each of the cost estimates indicated, uh, they all consider four lanes of traffic and a left-hand turn lane being opened during construction. Returning to hydraulic modeling, we just wanted to show how each of the conceptual alternative solutions were, were put into the existing model by adjusting for 
the larger bridge and the channel configuration associated with each of the options. You can see in the top left, the existing conditions, the familiar spill out of the channel and valley towards Dundas. But then for each of the options, one through three, they all do a very good job of keeping all of the flow, all of that regulatory storm flow into the valley, albeit at somewhat different depths here and there, but all three options uh, are, are deemed pretty good from a hydraulic modeling standpoint. We'll now look at the preliminary impact assessment associated with each conceptual alternative solution. In terms of infrastructure and property, each of the options has its own impacts associated. There are quite a few here and we won't go through all of them, but some of the major ones include a 900 millimeter sanitary that is right close to Dixie Road, a smaller sanitary sewer crossing approximately 400 meters downstream of Dixie. As well, there are some power lines that will likely need to be relocated in some format, quite a few storm sewer outlets, and close by uh, parking lots, and well as the potential for some property acquisition. The preliminary impact assessment for natural heritage includes many items that are common across all three options. And this would include respecting breeding bird windows, um, as well bat maternity roosting areas would have to be preserved or impacts mitigated, as well a butternut tree has been identified downstream of Dixie Road, and that would, that would have to be addressed through an offsetting plan if anything were to occur to that area. It should be pointed out that option two, which is improved conveyance by making room for the creek, would result in more site disturbance in that floodplain area downstream of Dixie Road. That said, I'm sure it would also have to include a, a good restoration plan. The preliminary impact assessment for archaeology has been based on the stage one archaeological assessment as completed by ASI. It should be noted that all three options will be required to have some test pits completed under a stage two program. As well, it's, it, it's important to note at this time we have not had input from First Nations and we expect there'll be some valuable direction obtained through that. Each conceptual alternative solution, including the do nothing approach, will be evaluated based on the following criteria. Under technical, certainly flood risk improvement will be an important criteria, as well construction approaches and climate change improvements. Under economic, certainly it'll be capital costs, operation and maintenance, and urban development considerations. Under environment, ecology, geomorphology, and archeology. span Under social, we'll have policy considerations, public input, property impacts, public safety, and support of parallel planning initiatives. As well, the criteria may be expanded and adjusted based upon the input and comments received from First Nations and Indigenous individuals, and will also incorporate tra traditional knowledge. Regulatory agencies and members of the public will also have input towards these criteria. A preferred solution will be selected using the evaluation criteria in collaboration with key stakeholders that include the City of Mississauga, Region of Peel, and Toronto Region Conservation Authority. The preferred solution will then be advanced to preliminary design. Finally, let's talk about next steps after this public information center. Next steps in the EA process include us integrating input from stakeholders. We will complete a detailed evaluation of conceptual alternative solutions. We're going to select a preferred solution from that. PIC number two will happen and we'll present results there. And we will advance the preliminary design of the preferred solution which is anticipated to include these items below. Just a reminder to please go to the city's website, which is mississauga.ca slash flooding and sign up to be on the mailing list. And perhaps you will want to also download a comment form, complete the form, and then send the saved file to either Anthony Dijian Domenico at mississauga.ca or Andrew Doherty, which is a Doherty at matrix solutions 
matrix-solutions.com. We will be receiving input until September 4th and gathering for input, gathering our input towards the next work to be done, which we will highlight at our next PIC. Thank you very much, and we look forward to speaking with you soon.